Um, all right, so let me set up the screen share. Okay, so um, yeah, so I want, I guess I want to pick up. Um, so, so today is going to be the the last of my lectures that is focused um, sort of on the general theory of quadratic forms, um, sort of abstract general theory that works over uh, really over any field. Um, but I want to start by, I, I think I, I was a little bit rushed at the end. So I want to sort of recap um, the results from yesterday at the end. So, right, so let's, um, let's recall. So last time, uh, so one of the outcomes was that we completely classified uh, quadratic forms over a finite field. Um, so we classified uh, quadratic forms over FQ. Um, and so we had the following proposition. Uh, so, uh, right, so the proposition is that any n-dimensional quadratic form uh, over FQ uh, is isomorphic to something of the form brackets one, brackets one, dot, 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 brackets one, comma, D. So you can put it in a diagonal form where you have uh, n at least n minus one ones, and then some other D, which is going to live in FQ cross. Um, so you can, well, you can always put over any field, you can put it in diagonal form, but over, over FQ, it's even better. You can, you can make all but one of the diagonal entries uh, equal to one. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, so you can also say, uh, so, right, so as a consequence, there are uh, two isomorphism classes uh, of quadratic forms, uh, say of n-dimensional quadratic forms, Uh, over FQ, and that's given uh, based on D. So D is an FQ cross, but it really lives in, it's only really def well-defined up to multiplication by square. Um, so based on the element D uh, in FQ cross mod FQ cross squared, uh, which is isomorphic to Z mod two uh, as a group. Um, so I just also wanna make a correction from last time. So last time I called D the discriminant. So, so, so D can be, I mean, you can, you, know, you can define this as a determinant of the associated symmetric matrix. Uh, last time I referred to this as a discriminant. Uh, I think that terminology is not quite right. Often the discriminant involves an extra sign factor. Um, so, um, so, so D is called it the determinant a determinant uh, of uh, of the quadratic form, and right, I mean D is something that makes sense over any field very generally. Uh, I mean, basically, you just take the the associated determinant of an n by n symmetric matrix, um, and again, it's called the, the determinant, and the discriminant is basically going to be a, a modified version of that where you multiply it by a sign um, for various reasons. Okay, so this was this was what uh, we sort of sketched at least the proof of last time. And I mean, right, so what, what was the proof? Well, the, the key point is that once you have a quadratic form of dimension at least two, it automatically represents one. It, all, it all automatically is a vector V such that V dot V is equal to one. And that means you can split off a copy of one. Um, and then you can keep sort of doing that inductively uh, until you get to something one dimensional. And then that's why that's where you, you pick up this, uh, this element D. So this is because uh, any two dimensional quadratic form uh, represents one, i.e. has a vector v with v dot v equals one. Uh, and uh, right, so that also follows because uh, uh, so any three-dimensional, so you can deduce this using any three-dimensional quadratic form is isotropic. So basically you proved this fact last time using a, uh, using a counting argument. And I think on the exercises um, explored some sort of generalizations can be uh, Chevrolet and warning. Um, and right, so let me also remark that this, this particular proposition, so at least the first part, not, not the two isomorphism classes part, um, it works over any field uh, of U invariant at most two. So uh, for example, C Laurent series T. Uh, and uh, well, so this discriminant D, instead of living in plus or minus one, it, it always lives in F cross mod F cross squared. Okay, so, um, right. So today I, I, I wanna sort of start to 
dig deeper into isomorphism. So, so right, so this, this worked great if you're over a field of small u, of univariant at most two, you have this complete classification. Um, but we want to think about, you know, slightly more general cases. We want to, um, and we want to study, uh, we want to try to classify quadratic forms up to isomorphism. Um, and as also, as I mentioned last time, we want to also study this actually sort of more powerful question of when is a quadratic form isotropic? Um, and right, so in general, what we're going to need is, well, so this, this determinant is a, is a first invariant of a quadratic form, but we're going to need sort of more sophisticated uh, invariants of quadratic forms. Um, and the idea is that you want to, you know, you want to write down some number for any quadratic form. I mean, maybe it's a number that lives as a group. Um, and maybe you can define that very easily if you have a diagonal form, but then you want to sort of be able to know when that's well-defined. So you want to, you really want to be able to know when are two diagonal forms uh, isomorphic over, over some field. So today, well, maybe the first order of business is that we want to really try to understand better uh, sort of how to, you know, how to, generalize this type of construction. So it's pretty easy to see that the determinant is something well-defined, um, but we wanna study um, isomorphism uh, classes and invariants. Well, I should say we wanna start studying this uh, quadratic forms more generally. Um, okay, so Right, so maybe just to start with, let me write down some examples of um, you know, how quadratic forms can be isomorphic. Um, so again, right, the idea is that we, want to, we can always put our quadratic form in a diagonal form, so it's some string of numbers uh, or some string of scalars in the field, but then maybe it's not so obvious when one string of scalars and another string of scalars actually represents the same uh, qu uh, quadratic form. So, so let me just give some examples. So as an example, if we have just a one-dimensional form brackets A, then that's, well, that's isomorphic to brackets A times U squared if uh, U is any element of F cross. So here A is some element of F cross. So that's, that's because we can rescale the, the basis vector. Um, so that, that gives us one way in which we can sort of modify that. I mean, we get the same isomorphism class. Uh, another example is if we take brackets A1, brackets A2, so if we have this two-dimensional quadratic form, then uh, we can permute the factors. So this is the same as brackets A2, brackets A1, just by permuting the basis. Um, okay, and then maybe slightly more a slightly more complicated example of an isomorphism of quadratic forms, again, of two-dimensional quadratic forms, is that brackets A1, brackets A2 is isomorphic to, uh, oops, sorry, there's a typo, uh, A2 brackets A1. Uh, okay, so, so back over here, so brackets A1 comma brackets, uh, sorry, brackets A1 comma A2 is isomorphic to A1 plus A2, uh, comma a1 a2 divided by h h sorry a1 plus a2 so there's an isomorphism like this uh sorry so question should it be u and v no u is a scalar here because these are these are one dimensional quadratic forms so they're i mean so a one dimensional quadratic form is i mean if you choose a basis it's just given by a scalar um, yeah. um so yes yeah, so it, it literally means squaring in the Field. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so this is this is an example, right? So so to formulate this, I should I should assume that a one is not minus a two, or otherwise this is not gonna gonna make sense. Um, and so right, so how do we see this last one? I mean, this last one is gonna follow because uh, well, it's it's a suitable change of basis. So I mean, if you have a one, you know, a one comma a two, and your basis vectors are e one comma e two. Well, then you choose the basis vector, which is E1 plus E2, and then you choose something in the orthogonal complement. And then if you sort of scale it appropriately, you'll see that you get something like this. Um, so yeah, so maybe I'll leave this, you know, leave the details to you. Um, okay. So these are, these are, these are sort of three examples of isomorphisms, and it's a, um, it's a, it's a very nice result of uh, a bit that, uh, that these are essentially the fundamental examples of isomorphisms uh, of where isomorphisms come from. So in other words, if you have any isomorphism, if you have an isomorphism of quadratic forms given by strings of numbers, you can always sort of build, I mean, you can always get from one string to another using these moves. So, so let me, let me, yeah, let me be a little bit more formal. Uh, so this is called Witt's uh, chain equivalence theorem. Uh, and see, it's the following. So suppose uh, I have an, an isomorphism between brackets a1 dot 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 brackets an, 
in brackets B1, dot, 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 brackets Bn. So suppose I have two diagonal, uh, I mean, so suppose I have two strings to numbers such as the associated diagonal forms uh, are isomorphic over, uh, over uh, my field. So then the statement is that we can get from the first string of numbers A1 through An to the second string of numbers B1 through Bn by using exactly the above moves. So then we can get from the tuple. So uh, now I just think of this as a tuple as a string of numbers to B1 dot 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 Bn uh, in a sequence of steps where at each stage, we only change two entries, two consecutive entries. And what we do is we use one of the above three moves. Only two or maybe one in the first case. Okay, so two entries are changed via the moves of the above example. So at each stage, basically, you're either rescaling an element by square, uh, you're permuting two consecutive elements, and from there you can permute any two elements, uh, or you're do you have two consecutive elements and you do this last particular step. So you add the first two, and then um, oh, you do that. You do this thing in the, thir the third item in the example up here. So the statement is that you can you can always you, you can always go in a sequence of moves from uh, from the first uh, or in a collection in a collection of moves of such moves from, from, from the first tuple A1 through AN to the second tuple B1 through BN. Um, so yeah, so before I, I, I prove this, let me just sort of explain. I mean, so if you want to define an invariant, if you want to define like an isomorphism invariant, so like a number uh, that you can associate to a quadratic form, well, this gives you a way of doing it. Well, essentially you need to write down what the, the number is for, uh, for a diagonal form A1 through AN. And then you need to check that it doesn't change when you do one of these three types of moves. Um, so that's something that you can check pretty explicitly because it's, yeah. So this is very useful, um, right. Very useful to define isomorphism invariance. And so we're gonna use this later on uh, in, um, in the course. Okay, so, so now I wanna explain how to prove this theorem. Um, so the proof of this theorem is, is the following. So, so first of all, essentially by induction, uh, okay, so first of all, let's say that, so let me also explain the terminology. So let's say that A1 through An and some other tuple, let's say A prime one through A prime sub N are chain equivalent. Uh, if you can get from one to the end, if you can get from the first to the second using these moves. Um, okay. So, right, so it's saying that if you have isomorphic quadratic forms, then they're actually chain equivalent. Um, okay, so, right, so how do we, um, how do we see that? Um, so what we'll show is, we'll show, so we're trying to show that A1 through AN, that tuple is chain equivalent to the tuple B1 through BN. And what we'll show, what we'll show, which will be enough inductively, we'll show that A1 through AN is uh, chain equivalent to something of the form B1 comma B2 prime through Bn prime. So we don't need to quite show that it's chain equivalent to uh, B1 through Bn, but what we're gonna do is it's, we're gonna show that it's chain equivalent to a, to a tuple that starts with the same entry, that starts with B1, uh, but then B2 could be replaced by B2 prime and so forth. Um, right, so why is this enough? Well, by, uh, so by the cancellation theorem, it's also due to VIT that was proved last time, this means that brackets B2 prime dot 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 brackets Bn prime is isomorphic to uh, brackets uh, A2 prime, oh, sorry, brackets B2 dot 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 brackets Bn. And by induction, 
uh, can, can make that into a chain equivalence. So by induction on the dimension of the quadratic forms, you can assume that that comes from a chain equivalence. And then you can compose the chain equivalences. Oops. So, so by induction on the dimension, so we're assuming that isomorphism implies chain equivalence in dimension n minus one. Um, so using that and using Witt's uh, cancellation theorem, uh, it suffices to show that a1 through a n is chain equivalent uh, using these moves to, su to some tuple that just starts with b1. We don't need all the other bi's. Right? Those can vary. OK. So right, so how do we prove this? Well, um, so we know. That uh, so if a one through a n um, uh, is chain equivalent to some tuple, uh, let's call it yeah, let's call it a one prime dot 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 a n prime. Well, then this the associated quadratic form is isomorphic, is isomorphic to B1 through Bn, which means that we can solve the equation uh, sum of, um, sorry, so you can, you can solve the equation B1 is equal to a sum of Ai prime times uh, Xi squared, right? So, well, because, because B1 is a, is a length squared on, on the right, it has to be a length squared on the left. So, so you can solve this equation for some xi. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the chain equivalent tuple. Right, so, so, so anything that's, anytime you have a tuple which is chain equivalent to the first one, um, then you can, you can solve this equation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the, the, the chain equivalent tuple such that the number of non-zero terms is minimized. So we're going to find the chain equivalent a1 prime through a n prime such that um, the number, so let's call this equation star, the number of non-zero terms in star is minimized. Min, sorry. Minimized. Uh, sorry, so there's a question in the chat. Um, uh, a prime and b. No, I think this is right. So, so a one through a n is is chain equivalent to b one through b n. And what we're going to do is we're we're going to work. Oh, sorry, a one through a n is isomorphic to b one through b n. And we want to say they're chain equivalent. And uh, or at least we want to say that it's a1 through an is chain equivalent to something that starts with b1. And we're going we're gonna to show that by a minimization process. So what we're going to do is we're going to find something which is chain equivalent. We're going we're gonna to look at all tuples that are chain equivalent through a1 through an, that, uh, and we're going to minimize a certain quantity, which is the number of non-zero terms in star. So we're going we're gonna to do a search over all tuples a1 prime through an prime that are chain equivalent. Uh, and for each of those, you can, you, know, you can solve this equation star. And we're going to minimize the number of non-zero terms. Um, okay, so we're going to find the chain equivalent tuple such that the no number of non-zero terms in this equation star is minimized. Uh, and the claim is that that's going to that's going to be that's going to actually solve the problem for us. So claim this solves the problem. Okay, so why why is that? Well. Uh, so suppose, right, so suppose B1 is equal to, well, so first of all, I can always permute around my, uh, uh, I mean, I'm allowed to permute the tuple because that's, that's one of the allowed moves. So let's suppose B1 is equal to a sum from I equals one to R of uh, AI prime XI squared. So suppose this is sort of uh, with R minimal. So again, I'm assuming I can, I can write B1, the number of non-zero terms in this equation star is, is minimal. And let's say that number is R. 
Um, and so in fact, so if I rescale, so by rescaling by squares, I can even assume that the xi are equal to one. So I can assume that b1 is a sum from i equals one to r of a i prime. Uh, because, I mean, that's going to follow because I'm allowed to rescale the AI prime by, by, uh, by squares. Okay, so what I want to claim is that actually R is equal to one, so that B1 is just equal to A1 prime. So, so what I'm claiming is that if I try to solve this minimization problem, I'm going to look over the space of all chain equivalent tuples to A1 through AN, and if I try to solve this minimization process, uh, then I'm automatically, that's going to be exactly what I want. I'm going to get something that starts with a B1. OK, so, so why is that? Well, so let's suppose B1 is equal to A1 plus A2 plus dot, 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 plus AR. Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, yeah, so the, the question, so we're, we're trying to minimize the number. So, so we know that B1 is, is a sum of the AI primes times some squares, and we're trying to minimize the number of non-zero terms. And so we're, we're gonna call that minimum R, basically. Okay, so, so the claim is that if R is greater than one, right? So, so the claim is that if, if we don't already have B1 in our quadratic form, then we can simplify the quadratic form so that we're reducing the, num the expression. So if B1 is equal to say A1 plus A2 plus, oh, AI prime. Uh, yes, thank you. So, right, so by assumption, we have some expression like this. And if R is greater than one, well, we can make the following move. We can take the tuple A1 prime, A2 prime, dot, 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 AN prime. Well, we can sort of move that to A1 prime plus A2 prime and then a1 prime a2 prime over a1 prime plus a2 prime, and then a3 prime dot, 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 ar prime. So that's one of the elementary moves we're allowed to do. We're allowed to collect two of the terms, and then we'll, yeah, so we're allowed to do this. But then uh, notice that this actually reduces the value of r. So, but then b1 is equal to quantity a1 prime plus a2 prime plus a3 prime, A3 prime plus dot, 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 plus AR prime. And so this should be AN prime. Okay, so by, so, so essentially the idea is that if we didn't already have a B1 in this minimal expression, so in this minimal chain equivalent expression, then we could improve it. We could improve it just by collecting the first two terms together by adding them because that's one of the allowed moves and we would get something smaller. So, and this is a, smaller expression. So only R minus one non-zero terms. And this is a contradiction. So essentially the idea is that you have your, you have your quadratic, uh, why the tuples are not the same length? Uh, well, because you've collected two of the terms, right? So, so, um, so we're saying that um, okay. So 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 we're saying that B one is, is an expression is a sum of R of the AI prime, and what we're going to do is we're going to simplify the quadratic form by collecting together the first two elements of the sum, and we're going to make that into a single entry of a new tuple. And so then it becomes a sum of length R minus one instead of a sum of length R. So 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 I, that's why I put the parentheses around A one prime plus A two prime. Um, so if, if you have a tuple, so, right. So I guess what, what you could say is that for, so you could give this a name. So for, for every chain equivalent tuple, A1 prime through AN prime, let's call this the B1 length. The B1 length is the, the number of non-zero terms in this expression, B1 equals sum of AI prime times XI squared. Let's call that the B1 length. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to minimize the B1 length over all chain equivalent tuples. And the idea is if the B1 length is greater than one, we can reduce the B1 length. And we can reduce the B1 length by collecting together sort of terms um, by, by, by doing this, um, by taking the sum, and that reduces the B1 length. So, so IE 
well, uh, yeah. So I'll just sort of summarize the proof. So proof strategy is um, look at all chain equivalent tuples a1 prime through an prime that starts with the, starts with the first one a1 through an that minimize the quote unquote b1 length and then sort of by this argument this must necessarily contain a b1 because if it didn't contain a b1 then you could collect terms and and reduce the b1 length um, and so then you've you've sort of made your form a1 through an chain equivalent to something involving a b1 and then you sort of conduct and then you can continue induct by induction with the dimension Yeah, so this is a really, again, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, okay. uh, so to make this argument uh, work, uh, we must uh, have this, uh, we must not have at some point of time, a1 prime plus uh, a2 prime to be equal to zero or these things. So, uh, because we are right. putting this in, uh, in the denominator. So uh, yes. I think then we must, uh, we must make this argument for uh, ionisotropic forms and then Right, so thanks. So actually, we don't need to do that. But I, so thank you for pointing that out. That's a, that's a good point. Um, so so right. So so Sundar's so question is right. So what happens if a one prime plus a two prime is equal to zero? Then right. So then I'm not allowed to do this move. But if a one prime plus a two prime is zero, then I can just cancel that from the sum. So the sum is not even minimal. So right. So so we're we're looking at really the minimal expression of b one in terms of the a i primes. And if if there's a sub sum that vanishes, then then our Sum is not minimal to begin with. Okay, so so right. So by minimality, in fact, a one prime plus a two prime is not zero. But I, I should have said that. So thank you for. Um, so by minimality, right. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the theorem. And again, this is going to be super useful because uh, we're going to uh, because these are sort of very simple moves. They only involve two dimensional quadratic forms, and they're going to let us. So they're going to let us define uh, something called a Hassan invariant a little bit later in the course. Uh, we talk about quadratic forms over the piadic, uh, the piadic numbers. I mean, it's going to show that it's well defined. It's clear. Okay. So that's uh, that's Witt's uh, chain equivalence theorem. Um, and um, so the next thing what I I, I want to do is to explain um, um, a slightly different concept, which is the concept of the the Grothendieck bit ring. And the VIT ring. Um, so this is sort of a, a really useful way of encoding this, this, this problem, right? So you know, we're interested in this problem of let's let's try to understand quadratic forms uh, up to isomorphism over uh, over a field. And uh, um, so there, there's a nice way of actually, right? So 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 maybe that's a little inconvenient to state. Uh, by itself, but there's a way of translating this into a really nice statement just in, in, involving rings. So we can encode this into a commutative ring and we can sort of reformulate this question in terms of understanding the structure of this commutative ring. So that's what I want to explain next. And sorry, so there's a question. Uh, so is there a least number of moves required for this theorem to hold? Uh, do we know what it is? That's a good question. I think if you look at this proof, it will give you, I think if you, uh, yeah, I think if you look at this proof, it is going to give you some sort of bound because, well, at each stage, you're sort of reducing this, like this B1 length. Uh, like each time you're allowed to do a move and you're reducing the B1 length. So I think, I think it is going to give you a bound. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway. Um, I think, yeah, probably if, if you really want to make it quantitative, probably it's better like to allow all permutations, for example, and count that as sort of one, one, one move instead of just allowing transpositions and so forth. But anyway, yeah, so I think you can make it explicit, um, but I don't know offhand. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is to define the Grothendieck bit and bit rings. Um,
And yeah, so as I said, this is, this is going to be sort of a really nice way of, of sort of encoding this problem of let's classify quadratic forms of isomorphism uh, just by producing a commutative ring. And you know, we can then try to study this commutative ring uh, via various techniques. OK, so this is called a grown Diekovit ring. So um, right, so yeah, so f is, f is my field throughout. So, uh, so the ring, uh, sorry, so maybe first let me define it as an abelian group, and then I'll explain why it's a ring. So, the abelian group GW of f uh, is, is, is the following. So it's all formal differences uh, of isomorphism classes of uh, quadratic forms over f. Right. So, so what does that? What does this mean? Well, I mean, this is saying that. So, if you look at isomorphism, if you look at quadratic forms over F, say up to isomorphism, then you can add them. You have a notion of a direct sum. Um, so, there, there's a there's a well-defined sort of addition law on them, uh, but you can't quite subtract them. I mean, you can't subtract vector spaces, for example. Um, so, what you do is you consider all formal differences of isomorphism classes of quadratic forms over F. Um, so, in other words, all expressions. Let's say brackets v q minus brackets w q prime, um, and uh, well, you say that two expressions are the same if uh, well, you, you move everything onto the same side. You move everything onto the same side, and then say that those are equal. Um, so I mean, sorry. So this is exactly like so. If you think about how you, if you know what you know, if you define the natural numbers then you define the integers, or the non natural numbers are non-negative integers, then you define the integers as formal differences of natural numbers. Um, and it's exactly that procedure that you're doing here. So this is somehow analogous. So I'm going to sort of put more details about this on the, the problem set, which isn't yet posted, but uh, so analogous to the definition of the integers as formal differences. Uh, of um, um, of natural numbers. Yeah, sorry. So maybe I should just right. So maybe I should just be a little bit more explicit. So, for example, we're going to say that the formal expression uh, brackets v comma q minus brackets w comma q prime is equal, and so in the grodin dieckvit ring to let's say um, brackets v well let's say v one um, w1, let me give these names, so is, is equal to brackets v2, q2, minus brackets w2, q2 prime. If, uh, so, so these are sort of formal differences of elements, and we're going to say that they're equal in the groton bit ring if, uh, well, so you move everything to the same side. So if v1 direct sum w2 is isomorphic to uh, brackets v2 direct sum w1. Uh, yes, exactly. So thanks for, yeah. So uh, this is exactly, sorry. Uh, so the question is, is this like the group completion of a monoid? This is exactly the group completion of a monoid. So what, so yeah, you expose a little bit on the exercises. So if you, if you look at isomorphism classes of quadratic forms over F, it's an abelian monoid because you can add things, but you can't subtract them. So it's not a group. And it's exactly the group completion where you, so whenever you, you have a, a, a abelian monoid, so you can add things, but not necessarily subtract, there's a universal way of forming a group. Uh, and uh, well, we sort of formally add differences, and that's exactly this construction. Yeah, thanks. Um, right. So in general, if you do this construction, you have to be a little bit more. So in general, so I should also say that if I if I really define things like this, then I'm sort of implicitly also using uh, uh, the cancellation theorem. So I'm sort of implicitly using Ritz cancellation theorem um, if I want to define things like this. Yeah, but so, so this is um, this is correct, um, and so the nice thing about this is that right. So this is actually a commutative ring. So uh, sorry. So first of all, this is right, so operates in a abelian group, but this is actually a commutative ring. And it's a commutative ring via construction that I think maybe hasn't yet been defined in the course, uh, which is a construction of tensor product. 
So via the tensor product uh, of quadratic forms. Uh, so quadratic or symmetric or bi symmetric bilinear forms. Um, so if you have symmetric, so if you have symmetric bilinear forms or inner products on, on, on vector spaces V1 and V2, then you get a symmetric bilinear form on V1 tensor V2 by tensoring the symmetric bilinear forms. So this is because can tensor symmetric bilinear forms. Um, yeah, sorry. So there was a question, why are we implicitly using Vets cancellation? And yes, that's exactly right. So um, the, the answer in the chat is exactly right. So, so this, this definition of, of when two formal differences are equal. So yeah, I would try to put this on the problem set. This, this is, uh, in principle, what you should really say is that uh, these two formal differences are equal if uh, instead of saying that V1 plus V2, V1 plus W2 is isomorphic to V2 plus W1, you should say that they're stably isomorphic. They become isomorphic after adding the same thing to both sides. Um, and, but the, the content of uh, Witt's theorem, the cancellation theorem, is that that's the same thing as just being isomorphic. So, yeah. Okay. Um, right, so, so, so this is actually a commutative ring. And I mean, maybe the simplest example is if, um, Right, so if, if f is a complex numbers, then the grown geek fit ring of f is, is just given by z uh, because all uh, dimension n quadratic forms are isomorphic. Um, so isomorphism classes of, of, of quadratic forms are as an abelian monoid, the non-negative integers. And when you do this procedure, you, 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 get, the, you get the integers. Um, so, so GW of, of, of c is, is, uh, is given by z. Um, and right, so, so GW is, it's sort of great because uh, if you want to say that two quadratic forms are isomorphic, uh, well, so any quadratic form just gives an element of this ring, GW, and to say that two quadratic forms are isomorphic is just to say that the two elements of the ring are, are equal. Um, so now you've translated the problem of when are two quadratic forms isomorphic to when are two elements of a commutative ring equal. So two quadratic forms are isomorphic uh, if and only if they yield equal to so any quadratic form, again, gives you an element of the grown bit ring. And the statement is that two quadratic forms are isomorphic if and only if they, equal, if they yield equal elements of uh, the grown bit ring of F. Um, and so this is great because now you know, we can try to study properties of this commutative ring and like we can try to study linear functionals on this commutative ring that for example, will detect isomorphism classes. Um, okay, so, um, so I also want to explain that there's a nice presentation for this ring. So there's a nice presentation of GW of F as let's say as an abelian group, and then I'll explain the ring structure. Uh, so namely, you have generators, right? So any quadratic form is a direct sum of one dimensional forms brackets A. Um, and so that means any element of the, the grown dieck fit ring is a formal difference uh, of brackets A's. So it's generated as an abelian group by these classes brackets A as A ranges over F cross. So, so this, this grown dieck fit ring is, has, has generators which come from the one dimensional forms and any element of the grown dieck bit ring is a, is a formal difference of sums of these classes. Um, but then you have some relations and the relations, well, the relations are just the ones that we've already seen. So you have relations that come from, well, brackets A times U squared is equal to brackets A for U in F cross. Um, and then you have the relation brackets A1 plus brackets A2 is equal to, uh, right. So it's equal to brackets A1 plus A2 plus brackets uh, A1, A2 divided by A1 plus A2. So this is actually, a, I guess this is a presentation of the Groton, I mean, this is a presentation as, a, um, as an abelian group 
um, because these are exactly the well, essentially by Witt's chain equivalence theorem. I mean, these are these are exactly the ways in which you can get from one isomorphism class to another isomorphism class of uh, of quadratic forms. Um, so 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 you get exactly these generators and relations. And well, the multiplication uh, is given by brackets A times brackets B is equal to brackets AB. So there's a very explicit presentation of the of the Grodin fit ring uh, by uh, by generators and uh, by these by these relations, which come from uh, comes directly from the from um, let's say. Um, right. Sorry. So there's a question. It, can you realize any commutative ring as GW? Um, I think the answer is no, because for example, one thing that's really special, so I'm gonna say more about a variant of this called a bit ring, but one thing that's really special about the G, this ring GW is that it has all these generators brackets A and all these elements squared to one. So brackets A times brackets A is brackets A squared, which is one. Um, and so most commutative, so in particular, it's, it's generated by all these elements at square to one. Um, so yeah. So I mean, in fact, there are lots of restrictions on on the Grotin Dieck bit rings. Um, but uh, so, for example, as, as uh, you sort of see this on the exercises, Grotin Dieck fit rings never have odd torsion. So all the torsion is two torsion. Uh, in fact, it's sort of closely related to um, orderings of the field. Okay. So um, yeah. So I can say well. So um, I'm, I guess I'm going to mostly focus on a variant of the Grotin Dieck fit ring. I just want to mention that. Uh, so the Grodin-Dieck bit ring itself. Um, so it, I guess it, it's, it, it classifies these quadratic forms. Um, uh, you, you will also so if you if you go to uh, uh, Kirsten Wickelgren's uh, lectures at the at the graduate summer school, um, then you will you will also see some applications of the of the Grodin-Dieck bit ring to um, uh, to enumerative questions, but sort of a very different form. Um, but so in in this course, what I uh, or, so I, I, what I want to focus on though is is actually not the Grodin-Dieck bit ring. Uh, but uh, but a variant of the Grotin Dieck ring, which is um, which is going to be a little bit more convenient. Um, right. So observe, and this is this is related to this phenomenon that we have we have this notion of hyperbolic forms. Okay. So sorry. So let me say it this way. So in the ring G W of F, um, there's going to be a very nice ideal. there's an ideal generated by the hyperbolic plane. So generated by brackets one minus one. Well, I guess maybe I should say brackets one plus brackets minus one. So this is the hyperbolic plane. And what's really nice about this ideal is that this ideal looks the same for every field. So this ideal, uh, is just z. Why is it why is it z? Well, it's because if you take a hyperbolic form and tensor it with anything, it becomes a hyperbolic form again. So, a hyperbolic tensored with any form is hyperbolic. So, I think this was some version of this was on the exercises. If you take a hyperbolic form, so Brackets one minus one is, in particular, it's isomorphic to brackets a minus a. So I think this was on the exercise. Sure. Um, so g brackets one minus one is isomorphic to brackets a minus a. Um, so you always have, so for any field f, you always have this ideal, um, uh, which is actually just a free abelian, I mean, it's, it's a z on, on the hyperbolic plane, which sits inside f. So we always have, an ideal, which is given by z times uh, the class of the hyperbolic plane, and it sits inside the Grotin Dieck fit ring of f. Um, and because it's an ideal, we can form the quotient. So the fit ring w of f uh, is the quotient. by the hyperbolic forms. Um, and so again, this is, this is kind of nice because hyperbolic forms, uh, sort of they look the same over any field and any question involving hyperbolic forms is 
sort of easy to answer, or this is sort of linear algebra. Um, and, and, and maybe the forms that are most interesting are really the anisotropic forms. So if we want to sort of uh, think about these questions, it's, it's, it's often nice to, uh, to quotient uh, by, by the ideal. And again, it's an ideal that's a copy of the integers um, um, and uh, produce, the, produce this vit ring, which is, which is defined as the quotient. Um, so in the vit ring, uh, sorry, so question from the left here. So basically when we, just to, mm -hmm. to make sure that whether I get this right. So when we quotient out by this mm -hmm. ideal generated by the hyperbolic plane, uh, what we do is that by the splitting theorem, we have about isotropic forms breaking into, well, splittings of hyperbolic planes and something anisotropic. We basically just focus on the anisotropic ones, right? Because we kill all the the isotropic bits, the hyperbolic plane summons. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly right. And that's why the vit ring is really convenient. So in fact, in the vit ring, um, right. So, so one thing that's nice about the vit ring that's, that's maybe nicer than what happens in the Grodendieck vit ring. So in the Grodendieck vit ring, not everything, not every class is coming from a quadratic form because you have these differences. Uh, but in the vit ring, in fact, um, any class is represented by a unique. So any element of the vit ring is, is, uh, is, is represented by a unique anisotropic form. V comma Q. So whenever you have an element of the vit ring, there's, there's always a unique anisotropic form that you can associate to it and conversely, uh, and that's because well, any form is uh, is anisotropic plus some hyperbolic forms, um, and the hyperbolic forms go away in the vit ring. And for example, if you want to form the negative in the vit ring, so 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 this is an anis so if you have a form v comma q, then it has an inverse in the vit ring. So the additive inverse in the vit ring of f of v comma q is v comma minus q. It's the same vector space with a negative of the quadratic form. And that's because if you add these two quadratic forms together, so this was on an earlier problem set, um, well, because v comma q direct sum v comma minus q is, is hyperbolic. It's a sum of copies of the hyperbolic plane and hence a zero in the vit ring. So this is really the, 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 the really nice feature of, of the vit ring, which I think well, one, one feature which makes it maybe a little bit nicer than the Grodendieck vit ring, which is that every, every element of the vit ring um, actually comes from a form and that form an, a unique anisotropic form um, uh, up to isomorphism. And so for example, if you wanna add elements in the vit ring, so to add in the vit ring, well, you add the anisotropic forms and well, it doesn't have to be anisotropic anymore, but then you just sort of peel off the hyperbolic part. Um, okay. So yeah, sorry. So there's a question, what did the, yes. So uh, I'm gonna say something about that in just a second. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so, so let, 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 me, let me also comment that in the vit ring, I mean, basically you have the relations in GW. So you have the same generators, you have the, the generators that come from the one dimensional forms and you have the relations uh, in GW, but also you have this relation that brackets A is negative of brackets minus A. Well, because if you add these two, you got the hyperbolic plane, which is zero. So this is the additional relation that you're imposing in the vit ring that you don't have in, in the Grotendieck vit ring. Okay, so it's sort of a really fundamental question now in the theory. So if, like if you wanna classify quadratic forms over an arbitrary field, so if you have some field and you wanna to try to classify quadratic forms over it, um, well, so as we've seen, it's equivalent to classifying an anisotropic forms because everything has a unique anisotropic uh, component. Um, so the problem is really like, how do we determine the vit ring of, of, of an arbitrary field? 
And what can we say about the bit length? So this is really one of the, um, this is really a sort of a central question in this theory um, of quadratic forms. Okay, so yeah, so in fact, this is very um, a very well studied question, and I think you'll explore it a little bit on the um, sort of explore it a little bit on the problem sets um, uh, on the problem set today. But maybe let me just give some examples. So an example is if the if you look at the vit ring of the complex numbers, well, we saw that the Grothendieck vit ring of the complex numbers is is just z, right? Because it's all quadratic forms are isomorphic. Um, and you're modding out by the hyperbolic forms, which are the, the ones with even dimension. So the vit ring of C is Z mod two. And the map is coming from take the dimension mod two. Um, so in general, for any field F, uh, we have uh, a dimension map. Well, if you think about it from the Grothendieck vit ring, it goes to Z. Uh, take the dimension of the quadratic form, it's not quite well defined on the vit ring because the hyperbolic form has dimension two. Um, so if you pass to the vit ring, the dimension is only defined mod, mod two, so it goes into Z mod two. So for any field, you, you always have a dimension map from the vit, vit ring to Z mod two. And if your field is a complex number, or if it's algebraically closed, or even if it's quadratically closed on the element of square root, um, then that map is an isomorphism. So that's the first example of a bit ring. Um, the next example is, uh, wait, is, is the real numbers. And in this case, if you look at the bit ring of the real numbers, well, the claim is that it's actually isomorphic to Z. And it's isomorphic to Z via the signature. Um, so, so if you have any quadratic form over, uh, um, Right. So if you have any quadratic form over the, the real numbers, um, then what you can do is you can, you can send it to its signature. Um, so that's the, so if you diagonalize a quadratic form, you have a bunch of plus ones and you have a bunch of minus ones and you take the difference, number of plus ones and the number of minus ones. Um, and that signature is, uh, well, the signature of a hyperbolic form is zero because hyperbolic form has, has signature zero, it's one minus one. Um, so the signature actually gives you a map on the level of bit rings which goes from W of R uh, into the integers. Um, okay. So in general, if F is a field which has an ordering, so what is an ordering on, on a field? I mean, it's like, it's a relation less than, it, there's, there's a notion for one, element of the field to be less than another element. And that relation satisfies the, the usual, um, I mean, all the usual properties of say the usual ordering on the real numbers. Um, and another way of saying it is that you have a notion of positive elements. So, um, so equivalently, well, let, let me not maybe spell it out, but let's say you have a notion. So, so if you have a field with an ordering, you have a notion of, well, notion of positive and negative elements. Um, right, so, so then you can define sort of a generalized signature with respect to this ordering. Which goes from W of F to, to Z. For, so, so whenever you have an ordering on a field, you can define some version of the signature for quadratic forms and you get a map to Z. Okay. So, um, so I'm just about out of time. So maybe I'll just say that, yeah, so you'll explore this a little bit. So yeah, I'm gonna to try to say more about the structure of the Vit ring a little bit later in the course. Um, um, but uh, so for example, you'll, on, on the problem, you know, on the exercise, there, there's a really, uh, I mean, so there are a lot of like general structural theorems about, um, uh, about the structure of the Vit ring. Um, and so, so if you have an element of the bit ring, you can always look at these sort of generalized signatures on the, um, um, for every ordering of the field. 
And it's a, for example, it's a beautiful theorem of Pfister. So uh, that, uh, that these, these sort of generalized signature elements detect all the torsion in the bit frame. And in fact, all the torsion is two, two power torsion. Um, so, so it's a theorem of Pfister, which will be on the problem set that any element in the kernel uh, is torsion. I mean, so that's kind of cool because it's saying that if you have if you have some element, if you have like an anisotropic quadratic form representing some element of the bit ring, then if all the signatures for every ordering are zero, then it's torsion in the bit ring, which means that some direct sum of copies of it is hyperbolic. Um, so this, for example, relates to the question of like you know which elements of your field are sums of squares and so forth. Um, so there there is a lot of sort of general stuff you can say about the bit ring and its relation to field orderings. Um, which you'll explore a little bit about, about in, the, in the problem sets. Um, and then later in the course, we'll see some sort of relations of the Vit ring to, to Milner K theory. And that's, so that's going to be relevant when we talk about the Vit ring of um, the piadic numbers. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm out of time. So I will, yeah, I will stop, stop here and we'll post the exercises soon. Okay, yeah, sorry. So there's a question, which is what do the, yeah, so, so please ask questions now, but uh, let me start by answering the questions in the chat. So yeah, so you can ask, you know, what are the units in the bit ring, for example? I mean, and this is a type of, I guess, sort of coarse sort of structure theorem about the bit ring. Um, I say coarse because it's sort of not seeing like no potent information. Um, and the, yeah, so this type of question can be completely answered. And basically the point is that if you have a unit in the, in the bit ring, then in particular, it's gonna to have to map to a unit via these signature maps. It's gonna to have to map to plus or minus one under each signature. And well, you could say, okay, so maybe you're, you don't have any orderings. In that case, you should also look at the dimension map to mod two. Um, and I think the statement is that that's exactly the criterion for an element of the bit ring to be a unit. So for example, you can classify, um, can classify the prime ideals. So, I mean, this is really fun because, uh, sorry, right. So you can classify the prime ideals of the Vit ring W of F, uh, well, basically in terms of orderings of the field. So it's, it's actually really fun because you can, I mean, you have the Vit ring, which is this thing you define in terms of quadratic forms. And you can show, for example, that, well, the prime ideals essentially all come from order. I mean, if you have a prime ideal of the Vit ring, you can use that to actually produce and ordering on your field. Um, so there's sort of a converse to the signature construction, which is that whenever you have a map from the vit ring into Z, it, it always comes from an ordering. Um, so yeah, so in fact, I think that's, that's gonna be on the problem set and it's, yeah, it's fun. Um, okay, so, so it, okay, so the next question is, is there an analog of Sylvester's law for an ordered field involving the generalized signature? Yes, exactly. So. I mean, so Sylvester's law is, is saying that some, the signature is well-defined up to isomorphism. So another way of saying Sylvester's theorem is that it's, um, 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 yeah, so the, um, um, the signature is a well-defined well isomorphism invariant of a, um, of, a quadratic, um, of a quadratic form. And in fact, um, Sylvester's theorem is true over any, um, any time you have an ordered field. Um, and actually, maybe it's a fun exercise. Like if you want, you can, uh, yeah, so you could you can prove it, for example, using the same way that you would prove Sylvester's. Yeah, so I guess you can prove, you can prove the sort of generalized Sylvester theorem using, using the same methods that you would use to prove it over, um, over, the, real, um, over the real numbers. Um, but I think it's also kind of fun just to see that, like to, to really see that the VIT, the VIT ring is really encoding like the orderings of the field and, and, and yeah, and the signatures. Um, okay, so the next question was, what is the map from the Vit ring to Z mod two? It's the dimension mod two. So if you have a quadratic form, you send it to its dimension mod two and right, so the dimension is a priori is defined in the integers. Uh, but if we're saying we're working with the Vit ring, then we have to send hyperbolic forms to zero and hyperbolic forms of even dimension. So they work mod two. So there's always a map from the Vit ring to Z mod two, and that map is an isomorphism if your um, um, if your field is algebraically algebraically closed. Um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so, okay, so the next question is what information can we get from the spectrum of the VIT ring? Um, I think the answer is basically you get, uh, the information that you get is, is what are the orderings? So, so the prime ideals of the VIT ring, they, they all come from, well, I mean, right, so you have this dimension, you know, dimension mod two, um, so that's always there. Uh, but then the other prime ideals, essentially, they, they come from orderings of the field. I think that's a, so, um, so in fact, you can make the collection of all orderings on a field into a topological space. It's a profinite space. And so you're going to see that in, in here. Um, yeah, so I should also say that if you have a field that is not ordered, uh, so that means, or that cannot be ordered, so that that by a theorem of Schreier means that minus one is a sum of squares. Uh, in that case, the VIT ring is all two power torsion. I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, so that, then it's, in general, it's not, you know, it's not going to be simple to torsion, but it could be sort of two power, um, two power torsion. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's also kind of fun, which is that, um, so I don't know if I put, the, well, I will try to put this on the exercise at some point. Um, so if you have a field which is not orderable, so it does not admit an, a notion of ordering, um, then that's gonna happen if and only if minus one can be written as a sum of squares. And um, right, so I guess you can, what you can do is you can ask for the minimal number of squares needed to, uh, to write minus one as a sum of squares. Um, and that is always going to be, um, sorry, I guess that is always going to be a, uh, a power of two minus one, I think. I'm messing this up. And, and that's going to be exactly the, the order of, um, yeah, that's going to be exactly the, the exponent of the bit, right? the power of two that annihilates the bit. Yeah, so the, somehow the, the general structure of the VIT ring is that it sees a lot of the, the sort of, yeah, I guess the sort of course structure of the VIT ring um, is going to see, um, it's going to see sort of information about like orderings in your field and, you know, when, when are elements like sums of squares and so forth. Um, I think when you, if you want to see sort of more detailed information, then that's going to, uh, so I think the most detailed information about the VIT ring is going to come from its filtration uh, by the kernel of the map from W of R to uh, Z mod two, the dimension mod two. Um, and so, 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 so that, um, um, so that, that vid ring modulo, well, the associated graded terms of that filtration um, were the subject of a celebrated conjecture of Milner that was proved by uh, Orlov, uh, Vishak, and Vrivatsky that uh, that's the same thing as Milner K theory mod two. And uh, so, so, so if you work on this associated graded terms, then you can really relate this. Uh, it turns out this is basically the, the Galois cohomology of, the, of your field mod two. Um, and so, I mean, I guess in this course we're, I mean, so in these special examples that we're gonna be interested in, it's gonna be cases in which the VIT ring is somehow relatively tame in that this, this filtration, so this filtration, which I'll maybe try to say more about like on Monday or something, um, is uh, is basically finite, or it becomes sort of torsion free at, at like after three steps. And in those cases, you can really sort of classify quadratic forms in terms of um, fairly sort of um, uh, sort of simple invariance, the, the discriminant, the determinant, and uh, uh, this Hasse Hasse invariant and signatures. More questions. Thank you, Akil. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. My office hours now. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I will sign off then. Um, yeah. So I will try to post the problem set in Sokoko shortly. And otherwise, I'll see you. Uh, see you tomorrow. We're seeing officers.